Hey everyone, and welcome again to the ThermalWorks Demo Kitchen. I'm Tim Robinson, Vice President of Marketing for ThermalWorks, and it's time for another Thermapen One live cooking class. It's been so much fun to bring you these live cooking classes. I've learned so much, I hope you have as well. It's a really unique opportunity to watch these masters of their craft and to be able to interact with them directly and ask questions. And tonight we have the episode that everybody's been waiting for, the dive in on brisket, the how-tos for brisket. Our guide and host will be Jeremy Yoder of Mad Scientist Barbecue. I'm super excited to turn some time over to him. Before I introduce Jeremy, I just wanna say a little bit about our sponsor here, the Thermapen One. I've got a blue one here for Jeremy, but also about the way that the Thermapen One interacts with other thermometers. This is what we call a instant read thermometer. That's the category of thermometers that the Thermapen One is in. We think it's misnamed that category because all the other thermometers besides the Thermapen One aren't instant reads. It takes five seconds, it takes 10 seconds, it takes 15. If you buy a uh, an instant read thermometer from Walmart, it's gonna take you 25 seconds to get a reading. That's not instant. The sub second performance of the Thermapen One is the only true instant read, but they call them instant reads because you can spot check your, your food, whatever it is you're cooking, right? You open the oven, you open the smoker, and you get live instant readings about what the temperature of the food is with a thermometer like this that then goes back into your pocket. This, however, is a signals. It's a leave-in probe. That's the other type of thermometer. I call them like a speedometer and an odometer in your car. You need both but they do different things. This one tells you how far you've come, and it comes with these cables and probes that actually go into the food and keep track of it. You can set an alarm, so if it gets to 203, it'll beep and let you know that it's there, and then you could go in with this bad boy and double check your temperatures. The alarm thermometer is also really great for tracking smoker temperatures or oven temperatures. It comes with an air probe, the signals does, and you can dial in those temperatures with a billows fan and make sure you're nailing your smoker temperatures over the, the, the long cook, right? It can take up to 12 hours or longer to cook a brisket. So this is really, really useful for those types of long cooks, but you've gotta have a Thermapen, Thermapen One to, to dial in the exact temperatures for when you pull it off and also when you cool it. Jeremy's gonna tell you all about that. Jeremy is a former AP Bio and Chem teacher from California who went back to Kentucky and just does barbecue in his backyard. He's got a catering business. He serves amazing food. If you've watched his channel, you know he always keeps a thermopen in the pocket of his, his apron. And he just has an amazing ability of describing what works and what doesn't and why. He'll tell you how and why to do the things you need to do to be successful at brisket. So if you're a first timer, this is gonna be an awesome episode for you as far as brisket. But even if you've been around and you're a competition hack, you know everything, I guarantee you're gonna pick up a few tips during this amazing class. So it's an honor for me to introduce the mad scientist himself, Jeremy Yoder. Take it away, Jeremy. Hey guys, welcome to the brisket class that I'm doing. I love science and I love barbecue. This is exactly what I love to spend my time doing. And I'm guessing that if you're watching this class, you love cooking barbecue too. So there are some initial things we have to talk about when we talk about briskets. So the brisket is actually made up of two different muscles, which means you have to consider both muscles when you're cooking a brisket. So on a human being, it would be like your pectoralis major, which does this movement, and your pectoralis minor, which does this movement. But in cow terms, it's the pectoralis profundus and the pectoralis superficialis. That's not super important, but know that there are two different muscles with two different grains, and they're gonna behave two different ways when you cook them. Now, briskets usually come in what's called a packer cut, which means this big hunk of meat. Now, it doesn't look appetizing right now, but after 12, 14, or 16 hours on a smoker, it's more than just appetizing, it is world-changing good stuff. So uh, there's a fat side on, on here. So like, if you see right here, all this white stuff, that's pure fat. The other side is what we call the meat side. Now, a lot of times when people are describing a brisket, they'll say that this is the top of the brisket and this is the bottom. So the fat side is the top and then the meat side is the bottom. But really, if you think about it, when it's on the cow, the fat side is actually facing the ground. So don't let that confuse you. So if I say the top side of the brisket, we're gonna assume it's the fat side up. And if I say the bottom side of the brisket, we're gonna assume it's the meat side that's down. So. When it comes to trimming a brisket, there are a couple things you wanna do. You want to get the fat on the top to a reasonable level because you don't wanna be chewing on just huge chunks of fat. Well, some people do, believe it or not, but most people don't. You want a little bit of fat that's gonna render down well. And so to make sure that you have some fat to provide moisture, um, you leave the fat on this top side, but you don't trim it all away. 
And to make sure that you're not chewing on huge chunks of fat, you trim some of it off. So what we're going for when we trim the fat off of this top side of the brisket is about a quarter inch of fat. So that's gonna be getting a sharp knife, making sure your brisket is cold. Here's a pro tip, okay? If your brisket is really, really cold, it makes trimming this fat so much easier. So one thing you can do is take your brisket and put it in the freezer for about 30 minutes before you actually start trimming, and that'll make trimming the fat easier. If the fat gets warm, then it's really hard to cut and it's slippery and you risk cutting yourself. So try to avoid trimming a brisket that's a little too warm. Now on the underside, we have a couple of things that we have to talk about. So we have a, a little bit of fat here, a couple pieces here and there. You can trim that off. That's not a huge deal, but what you do want to trim out is this humongous chunk of fat right here. So you don't want to dig a huge cave in there, but if you just get your knife at like a 45 degree angle and trim that out, um, that'll be kind of the easiest way to do it. Now, brisket has a lot of fat in it and you want to render the fat. In this video, I'm going to be talking a lot about rendered fat. And essentially all that means is melted fat. So fat that's crispy in bacon is really tasty or fat that's melted and rendered really well is also really tasty. But what people usually don't like what they find unpalatable is unrendered fat. So one of our big goals in cooking brisket and something that often gets overlooked is rendered fat. People will talk about rubs. They'll talk about what kind of wood are they using apple? Are they using cherry? Are they using whatever? But really, if you render the fat well, the meat is smoky and it's tender, pretty much any other sin can be forgiven. So we're gonna focus on the basics and we're gonna focus on the science that underlies all of this. So I want to teach you guys the principles of barbecue so that you can adapt your barbecue to whatever the situation is. So these principles apply to every kind of smoker. They apply to everything that you're gonna barbecue. And so I wanna give you tools in your tool belt to attack any barbecue situation you might encounter. So I'm gonna to get to trimming this brisket and uh, as I do that, I'm gonna try to answer some questions. So if you have questions, start submitting them right now. I wanna answer as many as I can because I want to interact with you because I remember when I cooked my first brisket, it was rough, okay? So I wish I could say it was great. I was a superstar, I was the Michelangelo of briskets, but that's definitely not true. And when I was trying to cook my first brisket, I was looking up information online and wondering, am I doing it right? Is this going wrong? Should I do this? Should I do that? So if you're in that situation, you're approaching your first brisket cook or your 10th brisket cook or your thousandth, if you have any questions that you think I might be able to answer, please submit them because in any way that I can help, I wanna help. Now, I might not be the world's best brisket cook, but I'm doing the best that I can and I'm trying to pass on what I know to you. So the first thing I'm gonna start with on this brisket while it's still cold, is trimming this top side or the fat side to about a quarter of an inch. So I'm gonna ask for some questions. We got some? Yeah. All right. So as I trim, I'll try to answer. Made a brisket just yesterday that stalled at 140. Any ideas why it was so low? And probably repeat the question. Sure, so made a brisket yesterday that stalled at 140. Any idea why it was so low? So this is something I'll, I'll address this more in detail later when we're talking about the stall, but essentially what happens during the stall is the heat that you're adding to the brisket during the cooking process is equal in size to the heat that's leaving that brisket through evaporative cooling. Now evaporative cooling works just like when you sweat. So when it's hot outside, you sweat, the wind blows and you cool off. Well, guess what? It works the same way in a smoker. As this brisket heats up, the proteins in that brisket coagulate. You can think of them as shrinking and you start to force that water. That water on the exterior surface then evaporates away, cooling off the brisket the same way sweat cools you off. So if you're stalling at 140, it could be that the, uh, well, it's probably the temperature that you're cooking at is a little too low. So if you cook at a higher temperature, you can power through the stall and the stall will happen at a higher temperature. Because if you have a low amount of heat that you're putting in, that means when the brisket stalls, there only has to be a low amount of heat leaving which can happen at a lower temperature. If you're putting in lots of energy, it's gotta take a lot of energy leaving through evaporative cooling for it to stall, which means it's gonna happen at a higher temperature because the higher the temperature goes, the more evaporative cooling takes place. So I would say if it's stalling too low, you could increase the temperature, but I wouldn't really focus on the stall itself. So a lot of times people will say, as soon as you get to the stall, you wrap that thing in aluminum foil and you power through and you get done as fast as you can. Well, if you're trying to finish a brisket as quickly as possible, then sure, that works. But if you're trying to make the best brisket possible, that's kind of the wrong way to approach it. And we're gonna talk more about that when we get to the stall. So the short version that I've already made very long is if you cook at a higher temperature, the stall will happen at a higher temperature. All right, I think we have some more questions coming up. In your fireman's video, you discussed the right size and amount of wood for 
the offset. Mm -hmm. How do you determine the right size and amount of wood for a Kamado, Weber Smoky Mountain, or Weber Central? Okay, so this comes down to the different kinds of combustion. The question is, in the past, I've talked about the right size and the right amount of wood for different size offsets. And behind me, I have all kinds of different sized offsets. I love offset smokers. I think they're the best, but I'm totally biased and they're just my favorite. Now the question asks, how do you determine the right size and the right amount of wood for something like a Weber Smoky Mountain or a Kamado Joe or a big green egg or something like that? Well, the issue is that it's a different kind of combustion. Okay. When you burn wood in an offset smoker, you have what's called primary combustion and secondary combustion. Primary combustion is when the wood heats up and begins to smoke. Secondary combustion is when that smoke actually turns into an open flame. Now, if you're using something like a Weber Smoky Mountain or a Kamado Joe or anything like that, you're actually not doing secondary combustion because you're not burning in open flames. So with an offset smoker, you can burn as much wood as you want and you'll never get kind of a, a bitter smoke flavor that can happen if you're using a big green egg or a Kamado Joe or a Weber Smoky Mountain or fill in the blank smoker that uses charcoal and wood. But the, the right amount is what you have to um, dial in. Now you can use wood chips, you can use wood chunks. Typically for those, it's better to use wood chunks because that way you can get enough wood in without having to put in handfuls of wood chips. And uh, you just have to go by your own taste. So you could start with something like six chunks for a brisket cook. And then if it's a little too smoky for you, you can dial it down to four. Or if it's not smoky enough, you can bump it up to eight or nine or 10. But really it comes down to personal preference on that. And uh, for those kind of smokers, you can oversmoke things. But for an offset, you really can't oversmoke it as long as you're burning a clean fire. And a clean fire is a fire in which um, the wood is burning with plenty of oxygen and you're not producing the kind of off flavor compounds that can make barbecue taste bitter if it gets too much smoke. All right, I need to stop yapping and start trimming here. All right, so do you have another question? Yes. All right, what's the next question? How do you prevent the flat side from cooking too fast? Yeah, so the flat is thinner, which means it's gonna cook more quickly, okay? So the only real way to stop it from cooking as quickly is to um, put it in the coolest part of the smoker. So in every smoker, or every smoker I know of, there are so, there's some portion of that smoker that's hotter than other portions. Okay, so for, for you and what that means is there's gonna be a, a spot where you want the thicker part of the brisket to be and there's gonna be a spot where you want the thinner part of the brisket be, to be. So the thicker part in the hot place in the smoker, the thinner part in the cool place in the smoker. So if you have something like a Kamado Joe or a big green egg or even a Weber Smoky Mountain where there isn't a lot of difference from side to side, what you really have to do is try to compromise. So you want to make sure you don't overcook the flat um, before, uh, you, you don't want to overcook the flat and undercook the point. But a lot of times what can happen is the flat actually can get to the right level of tenderness at a higher temperature than the point. So the point might be tender at 200 and the flat might only get tender at 205, 206. So um, I would say if you have a variable, uh, well, if, if there are temperature differences on your smoker, um, put the point toward the hottest part and the flat toward the coolest part and that should solve a lot of your problems. If you can't do that, then you're just gonna have to find a compromise of the right level of doneness that makes the flat and the point good. Okay, this is a related question. Okay, related question. Okay, my briskets fall apart when I'm done, why? Okay, your briskets fall apart when they're done because it's overcooked. So kind of definitionally, if your brisket is falling apart, that means it's overcooked. Now, if you have the choice of overcooking a brisket or undercooking a brisket, I would always <laughs> overcook that brisket. Because for most people, they don't know that that brisket is overcooked. They're like, oh, it's falling apart. It's amazing. So if you're going to make an error, I would make an error on that side of the equation. Um, so you could be cooking the brisket to too high a final temperature. Uh, usually something like 203 is good. But if you cook a brisket quickly, so something like seven, eight hours, you're going to have to cook to a higher temperature usually. And the issue that you may be running into is you may have read or you may have encountered the idea that you need to rest your brisket in a cooler. Now I would say that's a great idea, but the issue that you run into a lot of times is if you pull a brisket off at say 205 degrees and put it directly into a cooler, that brisket is gonna continue to cook for quite a while. So all that connective tissue that makes a brisket tough is breaking down and you're gonna get a mushy brisket, which if you've invested a long time into making a brisket, you don't want it to turn out to be something that you're disappointed by. So I would say, cook to a lower temperature. And if you're taking your brisket off and putting it directly into a cooler, 
I wouldn't do that anymore. I'd pull it off, let it cool to 180. If you have a thermopen, then it's easy to tell exactly what the temperature is. I'd let it cool to 180, 175, then put it in the cooler, and then I don't think it'll overcook. Okay. Oh, well, if you cut too deeply when trimming, that means you have cooked a brisket in your life. Okay, so it's not a huge deal. Um, I wouldn't carry on with that cut. You might have a divot, that's okay. But then, you know, I take that piece off and then go back up to the fat side and continue to trim. So it's not the end of the world. One beautiful thing about cooking a brisket for a long time is it covers up your trimming mistakes because the bark and the crust that you form on the outside makes the whole thing kind of look like a meteorite. And you can't really tell, oh, he didn't trim that very well there. So I would say not a big deal. Just don't keep shaving the meat. So if you have a divot, okay, go back up to the fat and keep going. Try to get that quarter inch. All right, now we have to talk a little bit about seasoning. So this brisket, you can see, is kind of, people talk about aerodynamic briskets. So this one, I'm not really thinking about aerodynamic. I'm thinking about how much surface area is exposed, which means things can burn. So I've tried to make sure that nothing is gonna burn on this thing. There are no thin parts of the meat that are sticking out by themselves where they can dehydrate on the outside, that is to lose water. And then once it dehydrates, it's just a matter of time before it burns. So that's all I've done for the trimming. Um, and now it's time to season. You can use just salt and pepper. You can use your favorite rub that you buy at the store. There are myriad different options. And the correct answer is whichever one you like the best. Okay, what I did was I started with salt and pepper and then I started adding things, garlic powder, onion powder, chipotle powder. And then I just thought, okay, I'll make this brisket. And if it's something I like, I'll continue to use that. If it's something I don't like, then there's no point in wasting my time. I'll do something different. And then if you just wanna say, I just want something that's definitely gonna work, there are lots of options. Salt and pepper will always work. Um, you can go to amazingribs.com and use the big bad beef rub. That's kind of a universally uh, beloved uh, beef rub. Uh, and then any of the big manufacturers, uh, you know, they make good stuff. But today I'm gonna be using a blend of Lowry season salt and black pepper. Uh, I find that I really like that and you can use whatever you want. If you're using salt separately, so if you're making your own rub, I would definitely consider salting separately and using kosher salt because you can see the large grains better, which means you won't oversalt the meat. Now it's a big piece of meat. You're not likely to oversalt it, but you can easily oversalt it if you used iodized table salt because it's so small and you can get so much sodium on this thing that it can be too powerful. So what I do is just kind of a liberal coat on each side. Now for competition briskets, things are a lot different. You're injecting, you're doing all kinds of stuff. But one thing that's really important to know is that competition barbecue, restaurant barbecue and backyard barbecue are all three different things. So on one end you have competition barbecue where you're going nuts, you want one bite to just assault your taste buds with flavor. For a restaurant barbecue, they're trying to make it delicious, delectable, but simple. Because if you're doing 100 briskets a day, you can't go through an intricate process with every single brisket. And then backyard barbecue is somewhere in the middle. So you don't want something that's not gonna be palatable to make a meal out of, but you um, can take time and baby that brisket and you can nurture it, do everything. You can watch on it, you can check on it, you can blow on it, right? You treat it like a baby, make sure that it's fine. Um, if if you wanna do backyard barbecue, you can do more of that. But generally speaking, you don't wanna do all of the elaborate process that's associated with competition barbecue. Um, so we got this guy pretty well seasoned up, some on the sides here, and we will put this guy on the smoker. Time check is 820. Okay, all right, that's because I yap too much, it's 820. All right, people who know me know that I talk too much. All right, so I'm gonna put this on the smoker and then I'm gonna answer some questions. All right, we have another question, I'm sure. I love you're having a thousand gallon being made. Is there any more information you can give on that and what you've learned about cooking on, much, on a much larger vessel? Also, why SD Metalworks for the build? <laughs> well, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting story. So the, uh, the short version is, the oh, sorry. Okay, I need to repeat the question. So there's a question about a thousand gallon smoker um, that I'm having finished up right now and how come SG Metalworks is finishing it? The short version of that is Eric from Fat Sack Smokers agreed to teach me how to weld and let me try to put together a thousand gallon smoker. I happened to move out of California before I finished the thing and I had to find somebody who could put it on a trailer for me. So 
really it's a fat stack smoker that I welded together poorly and it's an SG Metalworks trailer and he's finishing it up for me. Now, I haven't even gotten a chance to cook on it yet and I cannot wait until the day comes where I can light a fire in that thing and cook some briskets. But in general, um, the question uh, to, for anybody who didn't hear, the, the question um, also asked what it's like to cook on a larger smoker. So you may think that cooking on a larger smoker is more difficult. And in some ways it kind of is, but really it's a lot easier because it's so much more forgiving. Because if you think about the volume of the cook chamber in a thousand gallon smoker and the, and the volume of one piece of wood that you put on, the piece of wood is tiny in comparison to the volume of the whole cook chamber. Whereas for a small smoker, you put a piece of wood on there, it's a relatively large volume in comparison to the cook chamber. So you get bigger swings in temperature. So big smokers, they kind of maintain temperature well, they're very predictable, very even. And for some reason that I don't know, um, generally speaking, my experience is the larger the smoker, the better the smoke flavor you get on the food that you cook in there. It could be because you're burning more wood and therefore you're putting more flavor through that smoker. Um, that's something that I, I would love to investigate in the future. And, I'm, and truth be told, I'm currently actively investigating that very thing um, with uh, some scientists who specialize in studying smoke. So that's, uh, that's kind of where I am with that smoker. It's kind of almost done and I cannot wait to cook on it. You have another question? Will you touch on cooking just one muscle from the brisket if you don't buy the whole brisket? Okay. So the question is, if you're only gonna cook one muscle from the brisket, uh, which one should you cook? So I would say 100% without question, cook the point, okay? Because the point where it has the two muscles stacked on top of each other with fat on the top, fat between, and then the meat side underneath is gonna be so much juicier than if you just cook the flat, okay? If you just cook the flat or the thin part of that brisket, it's gonna be really, really, really hard to keep it moist. You're gonna to have to take extra steps to make sure it's moist for two reasons. Number one, it's thinner, which means it can dry out more quickly. And the second reason is there's usually less marbling in the muscle of, uh, well, in that muscle, in the flat muscle. So what you perceive, if you've heard me say this one time, you heard me say it a million times, what you perceive as moisture is usually rendered fat. And so in the flat, since there's not very much marbling in there, it's really hard to get enough fat to render to make it juicy. So you're gonna be far better off, in my opinion, cooking just the point rather than just the flat. Okay, so we're gonna answer another question in a second, but I need to talk about wrapping a brisket and the stall. So the issue that you run into when you cook a brisket is you'll put it on and then some things start happening, okay? One of them is you'll notice that the brisket starts to shrink up and that's because of the coagulation of proteins. If you don't know what the coagulation of proteins is, basically it's when those proteins shrink up and get really tight. So a lot of times you'll put on a brisket and um, it'll be really floppy and limp. And then if you try to move it, you know, two hours later, it's stiff as a board. That's because those proteins are tightening up and uh, it's forcing water out. The whole thing is shrinking up. Uh, also, you're gonna wanna render the fat. So a lot of people ask me, should I go fat side up or should I go fat side down? And the answer is put the fat side toward wherever the heat is coming from. So on an offset smoker, like the ones behind me, these, this is a fat stack 80 gallon and a fat stack 120 gallon. The heat is at the top. So I put the fat side up because I want that to take the brunt of the punishment for two reasons. Number one, I wanna protect the meat side. And number two, I want that fat to get really hot to render it down. I want it to melt so that you're not chewing on fat, but it just kind of gets mixed in with every bite and lubricates every bite to make it seem extra, extra juicy. Um, and then another thing that we touched on earlier is the stall. So it's when the heat that you're putting in is equal to the heat that's coming out through evaporative cooling. And usually that takes place at something like 165 degrees. Now, if you don't know what the temperature of your brisket is, you can obviously use your thermopen and the thermopen one is far and away the, the best digital instant read thermometer on the market. It's not even close. I could you know, talk for an hour about just that and you heard me talk now, so you probably believe me there. Um, but usually at about 165 degrees, that's when the stall takes place. Now, if you don't really feel comfortable with kind of having an intuitive sense of how long it's gonna to take to get to the stall, you can always use one of the Thermoworks um, leave-in probes. Uh, I have one of those and you can, if you get the wireless one, you can be inside and you can see exactly what the temperature of the smoker is and exactly what the temperature of the meat that you're cooking is. So if you're unsure, if you're worried, if you're only doing you know one or two briskets, that is a great, great option. 
Now, if you cooked a bunch of briskets and you kind of have an intuitive feel of how it's going to go, uh, it's going to take about eight hours. It's going to be at 165 degrees. Then you don't really need one of those necessarily. It never hurts to have more information. But when you get to the stall, a lot of people will say, oh, it's at the stall. I wrap and finish it. No, I wouldn't say so. What I would say is that you allow the brisket to get to the stall and you allow it to kind of work through the stall for probably an hour or two hours. Because what happens is it's still sweating out water. And so you're losing water, but concentrating the flavor. Now, one of the reasons dry aged beef is so popular is because the flavor is concentrated and it's kind of a more profound flavor on the palate. I think that with a brisket, that process is also valuable. Now, if you've ever seen somebody cook a brisket and they slice it open and you see the meat and it looks gray, to me, that's a signal that that brisket hasn't sweated out enough water. That's not always true, but I think a lot of times it is true, just in my own experience. Um, if a brisket has sweated out enough water, a lot of times you'll cut into that brisket and the meat will appear brown. So at the stall, usually at about 160, 165 degrees, I would let it hang out in the stall for an hour or two hours, but then you come to the issue of wrapping. And so there are two camps when it comes to wrapping. One is we use butcher paper. One is we use aluminum foil. Um, they both have their merits. Aluminum foil kind of traps in all the water, almost completely stops the evaporative cooling process and you finish really quickly and you make sure nothing on the outside of that brisket gets hard, nothing too crusty. Um, you kind of make sure everything is moist. With butcher paper, you trap in a lot of the water uh, but you don't trap in all the water so you don't lose the bark on the outside. So the bark is the, you know, rendered fat, the, the rub that you put on, the smoke, it's all that flavor on the outside. If you have too much water around it, you can sometimes wash away the bark. And if you work for a long time to create it, you don't want to wash it away. So I like to use butcher paper. And then the final thing is uh, I'm going to demonstrate exactly how I wrap with butcher paper. Um, it could be a lot more complicated than this, but I find that this works best for me. So I'll show you how to do that. But while I'm getting ready for that, let's answer another question. Uh, I don't, so the question is no mustard or anything else before the rub. Now for me, I don't really find value in putting the mustard on there. Uh, you've probably heard it's a binder. It doesn't really flavor the meat. Uh, and I think that that's probably true, but, uh, ultimately I think that if you have a brisket, that's warm enough that you have liquid on the outside already, um, the rub kind of sticks and kind of in my experience, um, if you use mustard, I think it kind of blocks smoke penetration. So I want smoke to penetrate the meat. So for instance, when I cook ribs, there are all kinds of really complicated, but delicious rib rubs out there. I use only salt and pepper because I want to taste the smoke. I don't know if this is the reason, but I think the reason is um, that if you use a complicated rub, you cover up so much of the meat area on the outside that the, that the uh, smoke rather can't really penetrate the meat and you kind of lose the smoke flavor in the background. So that's why I don't use mustard. Uh, I'm still working through things and trying to experiment, but that's why I don't use mustard. Let's uh, answer another question. What's the ratio of black pepper to cream salt? Black pepper to cream salt? Okay. Okay, what's the ratio of black pepper to seasoned salt and what? And is it table pepper? Table pepper, it is coarse ground black pepper that I use. So the ratio of seasoned salt to um, black pepper is about 30% or let's say 30% by volume uh, seasoned salt and 70% black pepper. Uh, the reason is because the salt in seasoned salt is more concentrated than kosher salt. Uh, and you can easily oversalt something if you're using iodized salt when you're used to using kosher salt. So about a 70-30 that's something I'm still playing with. I think the safest bet is to go something like 60% black pepper to 40% kosher salt. And then you find it, you find kind of the sweet spot of how you like your brisket to taste in terms of salinity, that is saltiness. And then you can adjust from there. Um, the Lowry season salt is just a flavor I like, but it's whatever you prefer, of course, is the right answer. You could try 35, 65. My thought is if you oversalt it, then it's kind of too far gone. Um, if you don't use quite enough salt, that's okay. That's kind of where I would rather be. All right. Do we have another question? What about using duck fat? What about using duck fat? Okay. Luckily I've burned off all the, uh, all the feeling in my hands. So I just grabbed that. Um, 
But if you want to grab meat, uh, anyway, you can, uh, you can use glove liners. So cotton gloves that go underneath these gloves. I get that question a lot of times and that just popped into my head. So cotton gloves, then you can put these nitrile gloves over the top. So you keep your hands clean and you don't burn them. Um, what about using duck fat? Yeah, you could absolutely 100% use duck fat. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. For me though, um, I want beef flavor to shine through always. Now, whether you use duck fat or whether you use uh, lard or whether you use tallow, um, I would say smoke whatever that fat source is before putting it on. So right in front of me here, I have some Wagyu tallow um, that I smoked. And the reason I smoked the tallow before I show you exactly how I use it here. The reason I smoke the tallow is because in organic chemistry, you can think of kind of two broad categories of compounds. There are hydrophilic compounds that love water, right? And there are hydrophobic compounds that don't like water. So I'm sure you've heard the phrase, uh, water and oil don't mix, which is, which is very true. So the tallow or lard or whatever fat source you're using absorbs flavor compounds from the smoke that the meat doesn't absorb because the meat is predominantly water. So if you use the tallow and smoke it or use the duck fat and smoke it, you get this kind of spectrum of flavors that you might otherwise be missing out on. In addition to that, using the duck fat or tallow or whatever you use, I like tallow of course, um, you add rendered fat all around the outside of the brisket and I'm gonna demonstrate that in one second. But that makes things seem juicier than they otherwise would be. Also, in my experience, it kind of protects the bark from washing away. So if you wrap a brisket too soon, there's so much water inside the wrap that it can wash the bark away. That's something you wanna avoid. And I, I think that using a fat source really helps prevent that because you can think of um, kind of sealing leather with oil. Um, I think it kind of does that kind of thing to the outside of the brisket, but let me show you how I wrap it. So two pieces of 18 inch wide butcher paper. And then I put the uh, brisket down and I put fat side of the brisket down. The meat side is up right here. And then I take some of the smoked tallow which is why it's brown. It just got smoked for eight hours. And then I put it on top of the brisket and I'm just gonna get my hands dirty and move it around here. Uh, I found that this is the absolute best way um, to produce brisket that's juicy, flavorful, and gives you a broader range of smoke flavor um, than any other method that I found. Maybe this isn't the best, but it's the best that I know of. So I encourage you guys to try it. And I think you're gonna be really happy with the results. Next, after I've covered this thing in tallow, Take the two sheets of butcher paper and roll it over once. And I try to keep this as tight as possible. So now it's fat side up. Okay. Then I tuck in the side. And I roll it over again. Now it's fat side down. And then if there's anything left over, I just kind of tuck it in under. So I'll take this, tuck it in under. So the fat side is down, the meat side is up. Why? because I want to protect the bark on that meat side. I don't want it to all wash away. So I take this, I put it back on the smoker. Now, if you're using an offset smoker, like the ones behind me here, um, if you have one part of the brisket that's kind of ahead of the other part, so say the point is at a much higher temperature than the flat, you can rearrange the brisket and put the flat closer to the fire so it catches up in temperature. This uh, smoker, they're almost at the exact same temperature, so it's not something to worry about, but if you're having that problem, that can fix it. All right. That's how we wrap briskets. And then I think we have probably some more questions. Do you have another one? Do you think that hickory is a good smoking wood? Hickory is a, uh, so the question is, do I think hickory is a good smoking wood? Hickory is a great smoking wood. Um, any hardwood can be used for smoking. Uh, the most common ones are hickory, pecan, oak, cherry, apple, peach, almond, alder. Uh, there are lots of great smoking woods. Um, there's, so, for a brisket. Uh, what's that? Specifically for a brisket. Okay, specifically for a brisket. Yeah, uh, hickory is great. More important than the kind of wood you burn is the kind of fire you burn with it. So, I would much, 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 much rather have some barbecue that's cooked with a very clean burning almond wood fire than I would uh, have barbecue that's made with a really dirty hickory wood fire. So, in offset smokers, uh, the idea is. Of course, clean smoke means lots of oxygen. You're not choking off the fire. And dirty smoke means um, you're not giving it enough oxygen and you're kind of making the, the wood smolder rather than burn an open flame. And you can tell a lot of this by looking at a smokestack. So generally speaking, the clearer the smoke is, the cleaner the fire is. And the reason is um, as you burn wood, 
right? If you're burning at a high temperature, you're creating small compounds that come out almost colorless from the smokestack. If you're not giving it enough oxygen, you're burning it at a lower temperature, which means you're going to produce relatively large organic compounds and it's going to come out as white smoke. So I think hickory is a, is a very good smoking wood, but I would concentrate more on how you burn the fire than the wood that you use to build that fire. Hey, do we have another question? Do you prep a night before cooking or just before the timer so you load the smoker with cold meat or room temperature? Okay, so those are two different questions. Okay. Do you prep a night before cooking or just before the timer? Okay, so the question is, do I prep the night before cooking or do I prep just before actually putting it on the smoker? I prep just before putting it on the smoker. Number one, because if you're doing a large volume of meat, you don't want to get it all trimmed and out of the packaging and then have to refrigerate it again. That can just cause a huge mess. That's one issue just in terms of practicality. But if you're cooking at home, um, you're going to have, you know, say one brisket or something, then it's not that big of a deal. But what I've found is that seasoning a brisket immediately before putting it on the smoker doesn't really have bad consequences. A lot of people think you need, you know, overnight for the salt to penetrate the meat. There are a couple of things here. So if you're putting garlic powder or black pepper or, you know, chili powder on the outside of the brisket, that flavor is never going to penetrate to the center of the meat. That's kind of a surface treatment. Whereas the salt that you add, sodium chloride, uh, it's, it's an ionic compound. What that means is there's a positive ion sodium and a negative ion chloride, and they actually dissociate when they come into contact with water. That means they split apart and then they can penetrate deep into the meat. So if the meat stays really cold, then it will take a while for that salt to get to the center. But here's the thing. If you're doing a brisket cook for 16 hours, that's 16 hours that the salt has to get to the center of the meat. Not only that, the rate at which the salt penetrates the meat increases as the temperature increases. What that means is the hotter the brisket gets, the faster the salt is moving through that brisket. So what I've noticed is by the time that brisket is done, the salt has moved as far as it's gonna move. And I've not noticed a difference in seasoning a brisket beforehand and then seasoning it right before putting it on the smoker. Let's do one more question. You load the smoker with cold meat or room temperature? Do I load the smoker with cold meat or room temperature meat? Number one, uh, I like to use cold meat because it helps produce a better smoke ring. Now, this doesn't change the flavor of the meat at all. It just makes it look nicer. People who know barbecue know, oh, there should be a nice red ring on the outside. It's simply aesthetic. It's not for flavor. But another reason I use cold meat is because I want to make sure that I get the meat cooking and I don't want it to sit out and allow for any kind of bacterial growth to take place. And then the third reason I use cold meat is because for that brisket to come up to room temperature would take a really long time if it's just sitting out on a counter. So the, the change in temperature of that brisket is gonna be dependent on the difference between that brisket's temperature and the temperature of its environment. So if you put a brisket in a hot smoker, it's gonna increase in temperature much more quickly than if you have a brisket just sitting out on the counter. So at this point, let's talk about our finished brisket. So the brisket got wrapped up with the tallow. We put it back in and we're gonna cook till tenderness. And that's gonna be at about 203 degrees. So that's kind of the guideline. And having a thermal pen one makes it super easy. I probe both the thick part and the thin part. And uh, usually it's about 203 degrees. It can be 205 degrees, it could be 200. So this will tell you if you're in the ballpark, but really the ultimate test is when you take this probe, you push it in and it feels like it's going through butter. There's not really very much resistance at all. So at that point it's done and you can take it off. So there's a brisket that I have that's taken off right here and I'm gonna grab it from the smoker and uh, we'll show you how to deal with that. All right, do I have another question? How is, uh, what is the biggest cause of creosote in an Oklahoma Joe home? I have a case on it, I don't know. Okay, what is the biggest cause of creosote in an Oklahoma Joe Highland if I have a clean fire, I don't get it. Uh, so the biggest cause of creosote is incomplete combustion. So if you have a propane grill, it's doing what's called complete combustion, which means whatever you're burning is turning into carbon dioxide and water vapor. So we wanna get close to complete combustion when you're running a fire, but you don't actually want complete combustion, okay? Because carbon dioxide and water isn't gonna give any smoke flavor to the meat you're trying to cook. So creosote, is a result of incomplete combustion, which means 
if you want to get rid of that, you have to add more oxygen and burn a fire at a higher temperature. So you don't produce the compounds that kind of, you could think of them just kind of sticking together and forming that creosote. So I would say hotter fire. So it might be a smaller fire, but a hotter fire um, and make sure you're giving it plenty of oxygen. So it might look clean, but you can probably make it a little cleaner and reduce the amount of creosote that you have. All right, here we have our finished brisket. So a lot of times people will see like magically uh, for cooking shows and stuff, it's okay, we put this raw piece of meat on, oh, magically it's done. I guess that's what we have now. This one was actually started extremely early this morning and um, we're gonna be ready to slice it up and we'll talk about how we wanna do that. But first, one thing that gets overlooked so often is rest times, okay? If you're not resting your brisket for an extended period of time, you are really missing out, okay? So an ideal length of rest for me would be letting a brisket rest maybe eight hours, 10 hours, up to 12 hours, but in that range, eight to 12 hours to me is perfect. And what happens is the muscles in the brisket relax, um, the fat distributes evenly, and you just get a superior product um, to taking a brisket, letting it cool for an hour and slicing into it. Also, if you slice into a brisket when it's super hot, each slice is gonna oxidize immediately and it's going to lose all the water and it's just gonna be a drier brisket than if you had rested it for a long time. Now, here's the thing. You can put that brisket in the oven while it's resting at the lowest setting and you can turn it, usually that's about 170 degrees. So you can turn it on and off to make sure that it's held at a safe temperature. And food safe for hot foods is gonna be 135 degrees and above. So an ideal uh, resting temperature for a brisket would be to keep it in an environment that's 135 degrees to 150 degrees. If you go lower, it doesn't remain safe. If you go higher, it's gonna overcook the brisket. And uh, you can do it in a cooler if you have a really good cooler, but make sure you have a thermopen or a Thermoworks probe to leave in there to make sure that it doesn't come down in temperature too far. So if you are having trouble with your brisket turning out the way you want, I almost guarantee that if you incorporate a long rest like that, you're gonna have a superior brisket to how you were doing it before. Something that doesn't get talked about enough, people talk about rubs, people talk about the kind of wood, people talk about the kind of smoker. This is a huge, huge, huge difference. If you've not tried it, please try it. And I'm confident it's gonna improve your brisket. So we're gonna unwrap this guy and then talk about slicing. Do we have another question? Um, I think ideally, oh, sorry, got sidetracked looking at this brisket. Um, so if you want to serve a brisket the next day, if you want to cook it the day before and then put it in the fridge and serve it the next day, um, you can do that. In my mind, that's not ideal though. Okay. Because if you think about what's happening when you smoke a brisket, you are burning a fire and producing volatile compounds. That means compounds that get given off as a gas. And that's what's flavoring the outside of the brisket. So the longer you wait, the more of those compounds um, could kind of dissipate and you lose the integrity of the smoke flavor you spent a super long time uh, creating. So the longer it goes, like the more the flavor dissipates. So if it's a situation where you have to serve it the next day, what I would say, leave it wrapped, okay? And then you pull it off the smoker, I would let it cool to, I don't know, maybe 170 degrees or so, put it in the fridge and then take it back out, still wrapped, heat it up to a serving temperature of maybe 140 degrees and then unwrap it and then slice it. And you're gonna have a product that's probably 98% as good as if you didn't have to refrigerate it as all. It's not, it's not gonna be quite as good, but it'll be close. All right, do we have one more question? Okay, well, if I can find my knife, I will uh, slice this brisket. But no, I got it, I got it, here we go, knife. Okay, so when you're slicing the brisket, it's important, as with pretty much all meats, that you want to cut against the grain. So we have the thin part here, uh, and we have the thick part here. And we're gonna slice them two different ways, okay? The thin part, we're going to slice it starting at one end and then go to where it gets thick, all right? 
So going like that, we're just going to go slice, 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 until we get to the part where it's two muscles on top of each other. Usually you can see a hunk of muscle right here, and that tells you you've gone far enough. Okay, so I'm just going to separate out those two because I'm not going to slice all these um, just to let them oxidize and, and go to waste. But if you guys can see, this is just a regular Costco brisket, but this is very juicy. So um, you don't need super expensive meat to make great barbecue, but you need great technique. Okay, great meat always helps, but it's not the be all end all of cooking good food. So this is the point. This is the two muscles stacked on top of each other. Um, and the way we would slice this is after we get to the two muscles, we take it, we turn it 90 degrees, and then we slice just like that, okay? And so I'll do one of these. So this first slice off the end, this is my favorite slice of brisket because it gets so much smoke, you see that this whole piece right here is pink. So packed with flavor. Also, there's so much marbling here that it is incredibly juicy. To me, if there's one bite on a brisket I'm eating, it's probably that bite right there. Um, as you go through, there's gonna be some, some fat in the middle between the two muscles. That's normal. You wanna to try to render that down during the cooking process, which means cooking at a relatively high temperature. Um, and then uh, you don't wanna cook it so hot that you burn anything. But I just wanna point out here, on this brisket, the outside is pretty much black, but nothing is burned. Everything is soft, everything is pliable. Like this fat right here, I poke it and my finger just sinks in. So it may look burned, it's not burned, it's just bark. And in barbecue, you're after bark and trying to avoid things getting burned. So let me cut down the middle here and we can take a look at what this thing turned out to be. Okay, so here we have the brisket, right? So tons of juice, not squeezing it. You can squeeze it and make more juice come out, but tons of juice and that fat is rendered well. And so the reason we get this kind of brisket isn't because we spent, you know, a million dollars to get the world's fanciest brisket but the technique, the process, and the principles of barbecue, I'm applying with this and had some great cookers to do it with. But um, if you focus on the technique rather than a gimmick or a gadget, you're gonna be able to make great barbecue. Now, the last thing I'll say, because we're probably running out of time here. The last thing I'll say is as you do barbecue, okay? Keep a log of whatever you're doing, okay? That way you can know what worked and what didn't work. And then, the next time you barbecue, I would say um, change only one thing at a time because then you can attribute the difference in the product that you made to that one thing that you changed, okay? If you use that process, you're going to keep improving. You're gonna be honing your craft in barbecue and you're gonna move closer and closer to what you have in your head as the ideal barbecue, okay? Do we have any more questions? Yeah, and you can go for 10 more minutes still, so. Okay. Uh, how often do you clean your smoker? How often do I clean my smokers? Okay. I, I would like to say I clean them religiously, meticulously um, at a very specified interval. But really the honest answer is whenever they start looking dirty, I clean them. This is how I do it. So what I do is I pull the grates out, pressure wash them, get everything off of there, right? And then I'm inside the smoker body, I pressure wash everything out of there. Now it's wet and that's metal, which can cause rust, which means that I wanna get that my water out of there as quickly as possible. So I build a fire and then I coat the entire inside grates and the, the, the cook chamber body uh, with oil because that oil is, is a hydrophobic layer. We've used that word a number of times. So it means it doesn't like water. It's gonna keep water out and prevent rusting. So cover everything in oil. And then the fire is going to allow that the, the molecules that make up the oil to polymerize and kind of form a plastic-like coating all over the inside of the smoker, and then you're ready to cook another day. We have another question? Would overnight rest at 170 degrees in the oven overcook the brisket? So would an overnight rest at 170 degrees in an oven overcook the brisket? Uh, in my opinion, yes, unless you undercook the brisket to begin with. And that's kind of a, you know, adjusting one thing to make up for another thing that can just be really convoluted and uh, kind of a problem. So if you're trying to go to sleep while you're resting your brisket, there's an easier way in my opinion. So what I would say is I would plan to have the brisket done at say midnight, right? And so the brisket comes off at midnight, it's 200 degrees. I put it on the counter and I let it cool to 180 degrees. At that point, I take it and I put it in a good cooler um, and I go to sleep, okay? 
I sleep until say six o'clock in the morning. So you've had a decent amount of sleep. I wake up at six o'clock in the morning. I stumble out of bed. I go over to the cooler. I check the temperature. So just boom. And with this, you can do it in one second. I check the temperature and make sure that it's at 135 degrees or above, right? If it's 125 degrees, I'm gonna take it and put it in the oven right away to bring it up to 135 degrees or a little higher to make sure that it stays safe. Um, if the temperature is still say 160, I don't worry about it. I, I go back to sleep for another couple of hours, okay? And so you just wanna make sure it stays at 135. If it's dropping down, you can take it, put it on uh, a, a tray, put it in the oven. You can cycle it on and off. What I mean by cycle it on and off is you uh, have a brisket that's say 135 degrees, right? You turn the oven on, it comes up to 150. You turn the oven off and just leave it alone. It slowly comes down to 145, 142, 140, 138, 137, 136. You turn the oven back on. So you just do that to make sure that the brisket stays between 135 and 150. And I think you're gonna be really surprised at, at how well that turns out. Okay, we have another question. Can you successfully rest a brisket for 20 hours? It depends on what you mean by success. Um, yes, you could, but I think what you'd have to do is keep it in a very moist environment. So if you have a warming oven um, that uh, controls humidity, you could probably do it. It's not an ideal thing because that fat that we're trying to render the entire time is liquid, which means it can drip out of the brisket. Um, that's something that happens like if you've ever tried to do a Wagyu brisket, there's a point where you reach so much fat that any of the excess just drips out when you're cooking. So the longer you rest the brisket, uh, the greater the chance you have of it losing too much water or losing too much rendered fat. But if you do, I would rest it at 135 degrees and uh, make sure that you have a very moist environment around that brisket. Um, and as long as you make sure that it's temperature safe, you should be fine. I wouldn't worry too much about resting for 20 hours um, as long as you keep the temperature safe. That brisket right there, what temperature was it cooked at? This brisket right here was, oh, I, so people wanna know what temperature I cooked this brisket at. I didn't even realize that I didn't tell you guys, okay? These were cooked with oak wood, right? So the briskets that I'm cooking right now and this one right here was cooked with oak wood, plain Jane, white oak, nothing special. Um, and it was cooked at 275 degrees. Now the smokers are special, these are prototypes um, and I'm testing them out and I love them but 275 degrees in these things works super, super well. So you get at that temperature, really great rendered fat on the top, um, but you don't uh, get anything burning. So that heat on the top side where the fat is protecting the brisket allows great fat render. Uh, and then the convection, all the air moving through allows some of that water to, to leave and um, you concentrate the flavor. You make everything juicy by rendering the fat. It's, it's just really good. Now, one side note is if you have a pellet smoker, 275 is probably the wrong temperature for you. That uh, diffuser plate or baffle plate is gonna give off radiant heat. So radiant heat is something that you've experienced if, you, if you're standing kind of close to a campfire, you feel the heat from that, but it's not heating all of the air molecules between the fire and you because you know the air is moving around, right? But that's actually light energy that's coming and making you feel warm from the fire. So there's gonna be radiant energy um, coming to the brisket from that diffuser plate or baffle plate or whatever they call it. Um, so be careful with that. 275 will oftentimes burn a brisket in a pellet smoker. Okay, do we have one more or do we have time for any more? Yeah, we have five minutes. Five why, minutes. Why not trim all the fat to get a better smoke ring and then just soak it with towel at the end? So why not trim the, all the fat to get a better smoke ring and uh, then just soak it with tallow at the end? So the issue here is different kinds of smokers, okay? You could probably get away with trimming off all the fat uh, on a Weber Smoky Mountain if you just baby that thing along, okay? Because there's not a lot of airflow. With an offset smoker, you can get more smoke flavor, you can get better fat render, you can get a lot of things. But one thing that you have to take into consideration is airflow, right? So that airflow and the evaporative cooling we talked about means that you are drying the outside of the brisket the whole time you're cooking. Right? If you have one side protected by fat, you're not gonna be drying that out, okay? So you're drying because of that convection and kind of, you're drying desiccating essentially, removing the water and then that can burn, it can, it can get really crusty. So if you've ever barbecued something and you cooked too hot um, or you um, kind of cooked too long, 
for a thin part of the meat and that part gets kind of dry and crusty, it loses the smoke flavor because that water that was holding all of those flavorful compounds from the smoke has evaporated away. And then you get neither the juiciness that you want nor the flavor that you want. So trimming off all the fat is something you could do if you're injecting and your goal is to pump that thing so full of water to keep it moist, like a competition style. But if you're doing an eating brisket, you should focus on rendering fat to increase moisture rather than injecting like a phosphate solution. One more question. Okay, so why do I rewrap my briskets before I rest them? So this is something I was asked about, uh, I don't know, a million times. Here's the reason, okay? When the brisket comes off, right? It's raging hot, um, but it's still hot enough that it's giving off water vapor, okay? And the reason I rewrap is a lot of times in that paper, there's gonna be an aqueous layer. That is a water layer that's got some of the, you know, dissolved rub, dissolved salt, stuff like that. Okay, that's not really a huge problem, but what can happen is during the long rest, that aqueous layer can rehydrate the bark. And if you rehydrate the bark, you can wash off that bark. And I do not wanna wash off the bark. So I take the brisket out of the paper and then rewrap with tallow because the tallow is gonna provide the sense or the sensation of moisture, um, but it won't hydrate the outside of the brisket and you can maintain that bark for a long period of time. Now, do you have to rewrap and add fresh tallow? No, you don't. Do I think it helps? Yeah, especially if you're running into the issue of too much water in your wrap and then the bark on the brisket is washing off, okay? I think that's about it, right? Okay, thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate it. I hope you learned something. I had a lot of fun doing this. I love cooking, I love science, so this was a pleasure for me. I hope it was useful for you guys. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I learned a ton. I hope you did too. I hope you'll be able to put your skills to use this coming weekend. It's Labor Day weekend this weekend on Monday. We're calling it Share Barbecue Day. Labor Day is Share Barbecue Day. We've got these special codes going on this weekend. Use the Share Barbecue code to get 18% off everything on the site. Uh, be sure to share that with your friends. It's a great celebration of barbecue and it couldn't have been better than with this brisket class tonight. Hey, be sure to tune in next week as well. We'll be drilling down even more in barbecue. Texas barbecue this time with Matt Pittman of Meat Church Barbecue. You won't want to miss it. So join us next week. Take care until then and have a happy Labor Day.